they maintain stay out there in the offshore? Look, I'll get you to stay there at those microphones, uh, Kelvin, and we, we can get some questions. I'm going to go to uh, Mayor David Ayres from uh, Waimakariri, first of all. Kelvin, I've had a couple of questions. This one is about local media for our community. That's a rejuvenation event you talked about. Is it, uh, there's a possibility on that pathway falls off the last year or not? So I'm just going to repeat the question, and I'm not sure everybody heard that. The question is about the so-called rejuvenation effect, which I think is... Uh, not the term I would use, it's kind of the uh, sleep interruption effect or whatever. <laughs> but you're talking about the Kaiapoi fault, and you're saying is there an increased likelihood of a rejuvenation event, or what a better description, on the Kaiapoi fault? Stephen, you. Hmm? Yeah. I think one small comment is that the most recent events have probably, because of their movement direction, has probably de-stressed the Kaiapoi fault a little bit, but that may not be the... That's, that's one small comment on that. So the, the setting for Waimakariri is that you've got some active faults which are similar in terms of their uh, location and displacements, as we saw in the Darfield event in September. Um, those are the structures that are onshore. And uh, if you take the Ashley, the Cust Ashley structure and extend it offshore, then you run into the Pegasus Bay Kaiapoi structures. So um, probably we're seeing a similar style and geometry of faults to the northern end of the Canterbury Plains as we do coming through Christchurch from, from Darfield and now going offshore. I think what's shown in the offshore data is that these faults are short, um, there are a lot of short segments, there's a lot of linking, and uh, as we've had repeated ruptures, we've loaded uh, areas around the tips of the faults, and that's what's propagating the rejuvenation events that Kelvin's been mentioning. Um, so the question that you've really asked is, is this likely now to trigger something on the Kaipoi structure? Well, the first thing is, we don't know what the state of stress is on the Kaipoi fault, but it's, it's probably a fault that has been more active than the structures to the south and therefore it may not even be close to uh, maximum stress levels for it to rupture. So that's the first thing. Um, the other thing I could say is that our studies that we've done onshore suggest that the faults onshore rupture on average about every three to five thousand years so it's much more frequent than what we're seeing to the south and that possibly means also that the structures at the northern end of Pegasus Bay are not in a state of stress. That means they're ready to go. So there are a lot of ifs and buts. Um, at the moment, the uh, activity hasn't migrated right up to the Kaipoi structure. It is dispersing, and that's also good news. It is going to the east. It's connecting through linking faults. So um, we can't put any certainty around answers for you, but I think that uh, there, is, there is some evidence to suggest that that's maybe a less likely scenario, if that helps. Thank you. The second question, I think you've really answered that, and that is, after the September quake, there were a number of uh, aftershocks sent to the Oxford area, and there were yes. a few faults in that area. Mm. You're suggesting, therefore, that there's not going to be too much stress on those faults right at the moment. No, of course, uh, in, the, in the Oxford area, in the Portis Pass, uh, going along the range front right up to Mount Grey, we've got the Portis Pass fault zone, which is a very much more active, large-scale fault system. Um, it's not at all surprising, given the sort of stress halo, if you like, that we have around the Darfield event, uh, that we will get aftershocks being triggered some distance away, and in particular around Mount Oxford, uh, which is a particularly complex geologic structure. Uh, we're not surprised to see activity uh, where some of these jolts, uh, faults come together and, and connect. Um, it's also one of the more active fault zones in terms of sort of long-term um, activity in Canterbury. We've had a number of magnitude five and four events over the last few decades there. Um, and that's normal background seismicity for that area. So I don't think there's anything to be read into having a few triggered after, and there's only relatively few triggered aftershocks um, in response to the Darfield event up to that sort of distance. You're getting out towards the kind of maximum extent of influence, if you like, of that, that stress change that happened uh, following the magnitude seven. Okay. 
Okay, I'd like to maybe just grab some of the media questions because time is getting on and for the community board members and others we've got a bit more time to come back to your questions but I want to deal with any of the media uh, questions that you have. So any of uh, the journalists over here got any questions? Okay, there's one over here. George, just briefly. Um, we, we don't have one. It's quite a major investment and it would require um, careful planning as to not, not only the purchase of it but also the use of it. I mean, there's no point in having something in the cupboard if you can't afford to run it. Uh, we have been looking at, if you like, a business model as to how this might work and uh, that discussion will be ongoing. Uh, in the meantime, we don't have the capability that we had from the Calgary equipment uh, but we have been doing some more uh, shallow investigations using the seismic equipment that we have in the department, which um, is, is providing some additional sort of infill data, if you like, at the present time. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's deal with some of the questions from elected reps that you are bringing to us. So, go for it. Yeah. No, Pauline, sorry. No, I'll move along the road. So the, the, the question was around liquefaction and uh, the uh, community members saying, you know, can there be anything left? And I guess the question, the subsequent question to that really is, well, what size of event would tend to trigger further liquefaction? if you can tell us yeah. something about that. So certainly it's quite alarming as you walk down the street to see these huge potholes that have opened up in the street. Um, what's driving those large sinkholes that you see is actually the water pipes that have burst and blasted out the material. If you think about how the ground's behaving, that ground's turned to a liquid and it's being squeezed out of the ground through cracks. And you can't squeeze things out of cracks if there's big air voids down there. They'll just fill up the voids instead. And so the sand that's come out gets expressed as settlement the entire ground going down. And so we measure that with the LIDAR, with the, the survey from the air, which tells us how much the ground is settled. And that's the information that gets used in assessment of areas. And you can see use that information to, to see how your land's been damaged as well. So, so does that therefore mean that when huge amounts have come out, that the land can settle at a much lower level than it originally was? That, that's right. So there's parts of Christchurch that are some hundreds of millimetres lower than they were two years ago because the land surface has dropped as that material has been taken away. So do we have information where those areas are? Yeah, so if you look on the CERA website, um, there's the presentations that have been done at the, the land zoning briefings, um, and there's a picture there, a multicoloured picture, that shows areas where there's been more and less ground settlement. Has any dropped to the lowest sea level? I'm not sure, actually, but I, I, I wouldn't think so. Roger, is that anything, or, or Ms. Minister Brownlee? I mean, the, the question was, have any areas dropped below sea level? I'm certainly not aware of that. Are you aware of any? Yeah. And that's, I mean, those are the red zones primarily. Okay. So one of the reasons that they're red zones. Ruth Dyson. I want to know if those events have triggered reconsideration um, of any time frames in terms of zoning. You know, what is happening with the review of park plans, for example? What about the white zone, orange zone time frames? What about the rockfall risk 
collapse decisions and the life risk model. What impact has 23rd of December had on you, and where are we with those timeframes? That's, that's, I guess, probably, yeah, probably a Sarah same, question. I think there's a change on their on their own stuff, all the way up to the top of the December 23rd, and the part and further we go to a period of April, we're pretty confident. So that's still under review? The Parkland's decision is still being reviewed? We've said we'll get back to those people in that period of time. And the life risk model determination for the people who are being stickered and out of their houses? Has it made any difference? No, I don't think it has. That's not, not as far as I'm aware. And the time frame for that model being determined? The box can't do a better answer that one. The life is model box. Look, I'm sorry, I can't give you a clear answer on that at the moment. I, I don't know that it has gone any further ahead from our perspective, but it, I think the key thing is that it comes back in that time frame. As I understand it, it's something which is of uh, particular interest to the government in terms of uh, where that ri rests because of the potential impacts for other areas. That's right, it's a real interest to the people who can't have any houses too. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think the response to that is that from our point of view, Everybody is working as hard as they can to get that information quickly, and I think Roger's given us an assurance that the timelines that we're currently committed to are going to remain. So that's an eight-week time frame approximately. Okay, right. So moving along. Thank you. Sorry, no, won't be. I'll be there in a moment. Karen. Yes. Linda Stewart, Bear with Pixis Community Board. My question is also about Parklands, and in yesterday's paper, I think it was, um, Mike Jacker seemed to diffuse the need for a reassessment of Parklands, and residents there are naturally very concerned. So could we have clarification on that? Is, it is, there is going to be a reassessment, or is it just a maybe? Well, what I've just heard is that, sorry, we've said there will be a reassessment, and uh, we've actually had a bit of a Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, my name is Paul McMahon from the Spray and Heathfield Community Board. Uh, there's a lot of concern in the community about hydraulic frac fracturing or fracking, uh, and the Christchurch City Council has asked for a moratorium. Uh, what's your scientific view on the risks of fracking in Canterbury? Kind of probably drawing a, a long bow in terms of the preparation for our meeting today, but I guess the question is. Even, even have a go at that one. The concern around the process of fracking and what Yeah, I think that uh, MED and um, others, other um, government agencies are taking a view on uh, fracking in the New Zealand uh, situation. It's very much into the um, into uh, petroleum exploration, not really into earthquakes, basically. Given that it's been linked with earthquakes in, in places like Ohio and England. Look, what, what I'd like to do is, I, I think that question, we clearly can't get a clear answer for you at this moment. It is a question of concern for a lot of people, and I would like to acknowledge that. But I think I'd like to come back to the primary issue that we have in front of us today, which is <coughs> recent earthquakes, the overall vision of what is going on, which I think we've had explained to us, and what might our future hold. So I'm going to now go to Councillor Broughton. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, I've got just a simple question, but I'm not clear on this. Are all these events, the major events, aftershocks, or uh, have we got four earthquakes, or, or three earthquakes? But the original dark air earthquake. Yeah, come on up to yes, the the, the original Darfield earthquake, uh, in terms of its magnitude 7.1, did modify the stress field in the greater region of Canterbury region, um, probably stretching out about two lengths away from the vault. So if you imagine the Darfield vault, and, and kind of extend it in both in all directions about the same length again, mm -hmm. then you're looking at how the Darfield event modified the stress in the whole area. So that's the greater region is where we expect aftershocks to occur. Effectively there are earthquakes, all the aftershocks are just earthquakes attempting to reach